The Byzantine military reforms in the 10th century changed the face of warfare in the Near East strongly and lastingly. The Byzantines introduced catapults that fired incendiary projectiles containing the infamous Greek fire. Their new heavy cavalry usually bested the enemy cavalry in well-coordinated charges and added much-needed offensive punch to the army. While the infantry was deployed in a big hollow square formation that provided support and refuge in case of a counterattack. It was this new war machine that would bring the empire to a new golden age. But it was a long way to get there. The Byzantine Empire, also known as the Eastern Roman Empire, underwent a period of cultural and military decline in the 7th and 8th centuries, often referred to as the Byzantine Dark Ages. Only in the 9th century, after decades of internal struggle and military defeat, did the Byzantine Empire begin to stabilize. This was due in no small part to the defensive capability of the Byzantine army, which at this time was already effectively organized in military or administrative districts called themes and centered around professional standing regiments, the so-called Tagmata, but it lacked offensive capability. This offensive insufficiency stood in stark contrast to the ambitions of the emperors. They wanted to take the fight to the Bulgars in the north and the Muslim states in the south. This policy, however, called for a more professional and more offensively capable army. It called for military reforms. In this video, we're looking at the three central changes that turned the Byzantine army into a force that would propel the empire into a new golden age. This is footage from a fantastic documentary, one of my recent favorites. It rebuilds ancient Rome digitally by adding 3D buildings from over 2000 years ago to the modern outline of the city and expanding on the ruins that are still present today, such as the Colosseum. But in the documentary, they also recolor monuments such as Augustus's Altar of Peace, which is just white or gray nowadays because the color has been lost over the years. If you want to watch it, you can find this documentary on CuriosityStream, who I thank for sponsoring this video. CuriosityStream is something we wholeheartedly recommend. It is home to thousands of streamable documentaries and non-fiction TV shows on topics ranging from history and science to nature, technology and crime. The series Rebuilding Ancient Rome is but one example that I picked to illustrate what you can find on CuriosityStream. And the series really stays true to its name. It spans 15 episodes and rebuilds monuments and buildings such as the Circus Maximus or the Roman Forum. It's excellent. Watching it really gives you a realistic impression of what ancient Rome looked like over 2000 years ago. I highly recommend checking it out. If you do so, please use the link in the description below. You will get a 25% discount. To improve its military clout, the Byzantine Empire needed more reliable and more professional soldiers, organized in a way that would allow them to operate effectively and aggressively on offensive campaigns. This was achieved by three major reforms. First, reviving a core of disciplined, effective line of battle infantry that could confront enemy infantry and cavalry, support their own cavalry, march long distances and function as garrison troops away from their home territory on a permanent basis. Second, introducing a core of heavily armored lancers that could operate in conjunction with the infantry. They increased the aggressive power of the Byzantine cavalry substantially and added much punch to its attack. This is often referred to as the revival of the cataphract. Third, using Greek fire in pitched battles by deploying handheld pumping devices and grenades filled with the incendiary. However, only very little information has come down to us about this last change. In general, we can track these changes mainly through a series of treatises on strategy and tactics written in the 10th century. Although they don't go into too much detail, these primary sources show that most of those substantial changes were completed by the 960s and 970s, but they had begun much earlier. Generally speaking, infantry used to play a secondary role in the Byzantine armies from the 6th to the 9th century, both tactically and numerically. But by the 10th century, this changed drastically due to political and military alterations. Not only was it now considered more significant tactically, but it also outnumbered the cavalry almost two to one. The new prominence of infantry was emphasized by placing it under a senior officer, the so-called Hoplitarches, who was second to the commander-in-chief. He was responsible for the infantry's training, field discipline and effectiveness in battle. Looking back to the proficient legions of the Roman Empire, which were still idealized by many Byzantine commanders, the focus of infantry training switched to discipline and drill. At the same time, the tactical role of infantry changed. 
The Byzantines recognized the weakness of foot soldiers, especially when facing cavalry, and understood an increase in numbers and improvement in training alone wouldn't be enough. They adapted to this problem by deploying their foot soldiers in a hollow square or rectangle formation made up of 12 brigades, so-called taxiarchies. This was meant to prevent the infantry from being encircled by enemy cavalry, serve as a home base for their own cavalry in battle, and to prevent the infantry themselves from turning to flight. There was enough space between the blocks of this formation to allow the cavalry to easily leave and enter the square. These gaps were guarded by additional small infantry units. Hitherto, the infantry had been drawn up in a deep line with very limited offensive capabilities. In these lines, the taxiarchies had been arrayed like a phalanx, with 16 rows of spearmen backed up by 4 rows of archers. The new taxiarchies, in contrast, were double-faced. 10 rows deep, with 4 rows of spearmen on either side and 2 rows of archers in the center. This way, they could quickly change their front to either side. For example, if an enemy cavalry unit managed to penetrate the hollow square, they could defend their back. Simultaneously, a new kind of infantry was introduced. They were equipped with a so-called menaulion, a long spear that served a function similar to the medieval pike. Operating independently from the rest of the taxiarchy, they had the task to stop heavy cavalry attacks by advancing in front of the rest of the formation and draw up in a line or wedge to break up the charge. In case of a cavalry charge, the infantry reinforced its lines by moving the Menaula toy to the very front, while the backmost line of the regular infantry reinforced the front as well. By this, they increased the depth of the front from four to six lines very quickly. Once the infantry had stopped the charge, javeliners moved forward to attack them from the flanks. By about 965 AD, when the Praecepta Militaria, one of the treatises, was written, a taxiarchy consisted of about 1,000 soldiers, with 400 spearmen, 300 archers, 200 light infantry and 100 menaula toy. The new square formations were more mobile and able to cooperate with the cavalry in new ways. Hitherto, the horsemen had operated from behind the infantry line. Now they started to battle in front of the infantry, but could always retreat into the hollow square, which served them as a refuge and mobile base. Deploying the infantry in this way also provided solidity and security in defense, a retreat for lighter troops and flexibility as the formation could be transformed into a solid attacking formation quickly. According to the historian John Heldon, a quadrilateral formation was nothing new, as square formations had been used by the ancient Greeks and also the Romans when setting up camp, marching through hostile terrain or in cases of emergency in general. Making this particular hollow square the standard formation, however, was an innovation. All these changes increased the infantry's status. The emphasis on training and new field tactics initiated an improvement in morale, tactical cohesion and battlefield discipline. At the same time, the use of mercenaries and the recruitment of high-quality infantry from among certain ethnic groups within the empire who had a reputation for being warlike became more important. Notably the Armenians, who were considered the best infantry well into the 11th century. All this drastically improved the effectiveness and prestige of infantry. Still, it remained lower in status than the cavalry and its equipment was relatively poor. But it was professionalized very much and probably closer resembled the disciplined Roman footmen than any Byzantine infantry in the previous three centuries. While this major change in the role of infantry was taking place, the cavalry of the empire was reformed as well. The regular mounted units, which made up the bulk of the cavalry force, were grouped in tactical units of 50 men, so-called banda. In battle, several of these banda were arrayed 8 to 10 rows deep, with varying width, depending on the army size. During the reforms in the late 9th and 10th century, Byzantine tacticians modified this formation several times, until it was usually 100 men wide and only 5 men deep, with the first two and the last row made up of heavy cavalry while the third and fourth consisted of mounted archers. So, like the infantry, the cavalry formation was now double-faced, which made it more flexible too. Inevitably, the proportion of heavy cavalry and mounted archers changed as well. In addition, the cavalry units were complemented with a type of unit well known from earlier times. The cataphract made its reappearance. These heavily armed cavalry troopers were clad in lamellar armor, mail and quilting from head to toe. The cataphracts were the elite of the army, and were, of course, extremely expensive. In battle, they formed up a broad-nosed wedge, the so-called Trigonos Parataxis. 
and their primary function was, supported by the regular lancers and the other cavalry, to smash through the enemy's heavy cavalry or infantry line, break up their formation and create an opening for the lighter cavalry, which would then try to turn the flanks of the enemy lines. According to the Praecepta Militaria, a full wedge was 12 rows deep, with the first row being 20 ranks wide. The width increased by 4 men every row, so that the 12th had 64 men, and the formation a total of 504. But these formations were not exclusively made up of cataphracts. The middle of the formation consisted of mounted archers. This formation was perfectly suited for shock attacks. As often discussed in our videos, cavalry could have a hard time when charging into undisrupted infantry formations. It seems, however, that the Byzantine tacticians had well accounted for this. The Trigonos Parataxis was ideally suited for a charge in three steps. The mounted archers would send a hail of arrows into the enemy ranks to open up gaps. Then the wedge charged into the enemy lines, for which the heavy cataphracts in the front were ideally suited. After first impact, they pressed forward in melee to cut their way through the enemy ranks. Finally, if the attack succeeded, the archers in the back took over to pursue the retreating enemy. In addition, the military manuals of the 10th century record a change in the tactical deployment of the Byzantine cavalry. For centuries, the traditional mode of deploying cavalry was to set up the entire mounted force into two lines, along with the necessary units of flank guards, outflankers and rear guard units. Apparently, the tacticians of the 10th century considered this unwieldy, unstable, and vulnerable to attacks from the side, and suggested adding a third line of cavalry, at least in some cases. This saka or rearguard was to be equal with the first line in numbers, and thus reflects the efforts to make units double-faced on army level. Finally, there was a third crucial tactical change. This is best illustrated by a passage of the Praecepta Militaria regarding support weapons. It reads, quote, The commander of the army should have with him small Chairomagana and three Elakatia. These are both some sort of catapult. A swivel tube with liquid fire and a hand pump, so that if the enemy is using the same deployment in equal strength, our men can gain the upper hand over the foe and break them up by using the artificial liquid fire. End quote. This is obviously a reference to the famous incendiary known as Greek fire. Greek fire was primarily used in naval and siege warfare by the Byzantines, and according to the historian Gergios Theotokis, this passage in the Praecepta Militaria is actually the first mention of its use in pitched battles by a land army. This was probably inspired by Muslim armies, who had relied on devices to project incendiaries already in the 9th century, mostly in grenade-like containers that were thrown by hand, or siege machines, depending on their size. These were used in the opening stages of a battle along with archers. Now the Byzantines expanded the use of Greek fire to land battles, at least to a small degree. Unfortunately, we don't know how exactly the Byzantine armies used the incendiary, which makes it hard to assess whether it caused much damage in the enemy ranks. It seems probable that it was deployed for psychological effect. The late 10th and 11th century proved how successful the Byzantine military reforms were. Thanks to the tactical changes, the Byzantine army had enough punch to reconquer a lot of the empire's former territory. Throughout the next decades, the emperors of the Macedonian dynasty were very successful on the offensive, defeated most of their enemies and led the Byzantine empire to new prosperity in what has been dubbed the Byzantine Golden Age. <laughs>